Good Friday morning, everyone, and welcome to the final Backyard Naturalist of 2021. My name is Tim. I work at the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and thanks for joining me here this morning, live on Zoom or recorded on YouTube, whatever the case. I'm super glad you're here as we look at one of the more iconic holiday time plants. They adorn our houses, our yards. They're in our songs and movies, the holly. And also, I promise a little bit of historical drama today that you might have not expected in a story about this mostly innocuous plant. Before I begin, I'd like to give an extra special thank you to Urban Ecology Center members. Hopefully this cold weather will continue. Looks like we're getting some snow, so we can take advantage of all the wi winter equipment just waiting to be used. They've been waiting all year to be used, and um, if you are a subscriber to the Backyard Naturalist, I am ever grateful for your support. Anyone can join us for free each week and the subscribers provide that opportunity and allow us to keep going. I'd also like to mention that we are now ex accepting deposits for our eco travel opportunity to visit Costa Rica, Costa Rica this August. Um, August is a fantastic time to visit, uh, to take advantage of the nesting sea turtles in the Northeast and calving whales in the Southwest. And we will have an information session uh, for this trip on February 3rd, if you'd like to see if this trip is for you. From the human phenology world, for much of the world today is considered New Year's Eve, which means tomorrow is New Year's Day, the first day of the year, according to the Gregorian calendar, which was introduced in 1582 as a modification of the Julian calendar. Uh, which allowed for the drift in the solar year that wasn't captured previously, and it reduced the year from 365.25 days all the way down to 365.2425 days, which is closer to the actual solar year of 365.24219 days. And what this shaving off that extra, uh, what is it, 0.7? 0 0.007, 0 0.075 days um, means that unlike with the Julian calendar where they had to add a day every 128 years, we no longer have to do this. Um, so both the Gregorian and the Julian calendars are solar calendars based on the sun, while the Chi Chinese New Year is a lunisolar calendar that takes advantage of the solar and lunar cycles. And that begins on the new moon that appears between January 21st and February 20th. So for this year, that is February 1st. And then there's the Islamic New Year, which is a strictly lunar calendar. So we have a solar, a lunisolar, and a lunar calendar. And the Islamic New Year begins uh, this year on, at sundown on July 29th. And continuing with the astronomical theme, uh, I hope you'll all consider checking out the quadranted meteor showers, uh, at least those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, as it peaks on the night of January 3rd. So next Monday night into the early morning hours of Tuesday, January 4th. And it's gonna be fantastic this year because uh, the thin crescent moon will be setting earlier. And so peak viewing for any meteor shower happens after midnight uh, when we're kind of moving into the the debris that's coming at us um or you can get up uh just before dawn so anytime after midnight to before dawn is a good time to see any meteor shower the quadrantids are brighter than your average shooting stars and especially without the moon uh, and if the skies are clear we can expect to see between 25 and 100 visible meteors per hour depending on your local light pollution so they got their name from the, a former constellation, Quadrans Muralis, and it's a former constellation because it was lost in the 1920s when the International Astronomical Union adopted the modern list of 88 officially recognized constellations, one for each key on the piano, and with that we lost a few as well. First they took away Pluto, and then they took away, well actually first they took away Quadrans Muralis, then they took away Pluto. But this is one of the more intense meteor showers of the year anyway. And so to get it with this great light, I really encourage you to try and check them out. Uh, you'll look to the Northeast, just under the Big Dipper is where they're radiating from. Um, and again, you can either go after midnight or the sun rises pretty late this year. Uh, so maybe early morning, of course, none of this works if it's cloudy, but 
we'll keep our fingers crossed. And this is, you know, maybe one of the top two uh, meteor showers this year. Okay, on with the featured backyard organism for today, the holly. So we give the name holly broadly to all of the plants that are in the same genus, the genus Ilex. And there are over 500 species of holly. Um, and so as we do with all of our featured species, we can kind of try to find their location, their address in the great tree of life. So holly can broadly be described as a eukaryotic plant. It's a tracheophyte, meaning it has xylem and phloem. Uh, in this case, it's an angiosperm or a flowering plant. It's a dicot or dicotyledon, meaning, meaning the seed has two embryonic leaves. And we get into all these points and definitions in, in previous episodes, particularly uh, the ones on oaks, maples, and squash uh, that you can find on the UEC in my backyard website or on the UEC's YouTube channel. And the plants known as holly belong to the asterid clade, which is the largest group of flowering plants. About one third of all flowering plants, more than 80,000 species are in this group. And it includes some very well-known plants like the daisies, the asters, asterid, includes the nightshades and all the yummy nightshades like tomatoes and peppers and potatoes. It includes coffee, tobacco, olives, sweet potatoes, jasmine, sesame, psyllium, an excellent source of fiber for a healthy gut, mint, basil, rosemary, and Brazil nuts. And, and that's just a very few. Uh, on the left here, we have impatiens, and the right, we have uh, the oregano plant. So within the asteroids, holly belongs to an order with a beautiful name, the order Aquifoliales. And that includes groups of plants with equally botanical names like the Helwingias, the Philonomas, the Steminuras, and the Cardiopteras, which includes uh, Citronella. The next step towards the holly is the family Aquifoliaceae. And then we can immediately take the next step to the genus Ilex because that is the only remaining living genus within that entire family. So it's a monogeneric family, which is pretty rare in the world of systematics to have an entire family made up of only one genus. And as I mentioned, there's over 500 species, about more than 560 species in this genus. And the holly include uh, both evergreen and deciduous trees, shrubs, vines, lianas. They're found worldwide in both tropical and temperate zones. Plants in this genus tend to look like hollies. They're slow growing. They have glossy leaves, often very pointy. Uh, we usually see the berries, but the, the flowers are usually this kind of inconspicuous greenish white. And unlike the maize that we featured a few weeks ago, they're mostly dioecious, meaning that the male flowers and the female flowers are found on different plants. So a given holly plant is either male or female. So if you want berries on your holly plant, you need to make sure you have a female plant. And then you also need to make sure there's a male plant nearby for fertilization. Although some species of holly can reproduce non-sexually through parthenogenesis. In addition to the iconic leaves, many people associate holly with those beautiful berries. But unlike the pumpkin, which as we already know is a berry, the holly berries are technically droops not berries. So just like cherries or peaches, they have a single hardened endocarp surrounding the seed. And I get into all of that uh, in one of my favorite episodes, As Gourd As It Gets. Uh, it kind of talks about what makes a berry a berry versus a droop versus a composite. Um, and I think it's okay if you still want to call them berries because I'm going to. So holly berries tend to ripen in the winter, which make them very attractive either as holiday decorations brought into the house or planted into the yard to provide winter color to your landscaping. Unfortunately, they can also be really detrimental because they have escaped many yards. And then depending on where you are, they can become super invasive, one of the more invasive plants to natural plant communities. So um, when they're native, the berries and the leaves provide a very important food source uh, for many, many birds, many, many other animals, uh, but they're almost always toxic to humans, often causing diarrhea and vomiting, and sometimes, sometimes quite severe, but usually they're not fatal, but they can be particularly dangerous to 
uh, young children and pets, both the berries and the leaves. So be careful. Um, the plant is, is pretty complex in its chemistry. It has alkaloids, it has caffeine, it has, uh, or, or I should say some of them have alkaloids, some of them have caffeine. Uh, theobromin is a, is a very bitter alkaloid that's also found in chocolate. Uh, many of them have saponins, which have this unique quality of foaming when they're agitated. So we use them in a really wide variety of applications from soaps to fire extinguishers to providing that beautiful head in a mug of freshly poured root beer. They all come from th that group of uh, chemicals. And for many thousands of years, indigenous cultures have used uh, the berries as an emetic to induce vomiting, to clear the system. Um, and holly berries have a reputation for uh, eliciting a quite powerful projectile vomit. So again, it's better to enjoy them for their aesthetic beauty, um, but keep them away from your mouth or the mouths of your children or your pets. An interesting quirk about holly is that they're often associated with an entirely different group of plants, the oaks, even though they're not uh, closely related at all. Um, and it's, it's likely this is the case because their leaves at least superficially resemble each other. They're kind of pointed and waxy. In fact, the name Ilex was originally given to the home oak or the evergreen oak, Quercus Ilex. And it's still called the holly oak, even though again, hollies and oaks aren't at all related, um, but still loosely associated with each other. So with that background, we won't be visiting all 500 plus species of holly, but we will take a visit to a couple of them, starting with Ilex aquifolium, which is the type specimen for this genus, uh, which means it was the plant that was first given the name Ilex. And so if you just say the name holly, people are often referring to this plant. So it's, it's called holly or the common holly, the English holly, the European holly, or the Christmas holly. It's uh, native to parts of Western Europe and areas surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. And there it is an extremely important plant for wildlife, providing food and shelter, birds, mammals, insects, um, for pollination. Uh, it's in particular in the winter. Uh, this, is, this is, as I mentioned, the berries tend to ripen in the winter and be available for wildlife. The leaves can provide shelter during cold spells. Um, and because it is associated with the holidays and because it has the traditions with humans and people of the color, um, it has also then spread quite extensively into other parts of the continent of Asia and into the United States and Canada, especially along the West Coast in particular. And there um, it's proved pretty invasive. Uh, along with the blackberries, they quickly will spread into native forest habitat and crowd out native species of plants. So in Washington state, the holly is on the noxious weed control board's monitor list. And in Portland, it is a class C invasive plant. But again, in its native range, European holly is very important ecologically. And then for humans, it has been used as cattle and sheep fodder. You do have to be a little careful with which species of holly you give to livestock because some of them can be toxic. Um, but the European holly, particularly the younger shoots that are less pointy and, and don't have the, the defenses built in uh, can be grazed by cattle and sheep. And for centuries, Hollywood was a preferred source for bagpipes, for the wood in bagpipes. Uh, and at, that happened, that was the case for quite a while until the, the global trade introduced other hardwoods to the British Isles. So the set of bagpipes that I played in college was made of ebony and African blackwood. And those are much more favored today in, in bagpipes, but uh, those, wood weren't, those species of, of uh, plants weren't originally found in the Isles. So for a long time, holly was the preferred wood uh, for bagpipes. And Harry Potter's wand was made up of wood from the holly plant uh, surrounding a phoenix feather core. Another slightly less famous species of holly is called the Yapan holly. And like the European holly in Europe, 
the Yapan holly is an extremely important ecological understory shrub in its native range uh, of the southeastern United States. And there is a, a little bit, a small population in central Mexico. And unlike the European holly, which is causing devastation here, the Yapan holly is a wonderful landscaping choice in the south, particularly for native landscaping. It provides all the benefits of holly, the, the beautiful winter berries, the colorful leaves, and it supports a healthy wildlife community. Um, and it's quite common in its native range, and a lot of folks can identify it. Um, the Yapan holly happens to be North America's only known native caffeinated plant. So caffeine is produced by plants as a bitter toxin for defense against herbivory. But of course, humans uh, have valued caffeine for in, in many forms for millennia. And Yapan holly was used by indigenous communities here as a daily drink, like a tea or a coffee. And um, they considered it a sacred gift from the god of purity. And as such, it was part of this vast trading network of hundreds of miles. In fact, the only no the oldest known evidence of Yapan consumption comes from the famous Cahokia Mounds in Illinois, which are outside of their range, their native range, and that dates to the year 1050. In addition to a daily beverage, Yapan was also used medicinally and combined with other ingredients to make what was known as, as black drink, which was literally a purging because the drink itself induced vomiting. And this was seen as a way to cleanse the sins for that God of purity, Yahola. And, it, and a key thing to remember for the story is that Yapan by itself did not induce that vomiting. It was a daily drink that people enjoyed, but when they combined it with other ingredients or when they drank it in extremely high concentration, it did cause nausea and vomiting. Um, and, and so I promised you drama and here it comes. We'll move forward to the year 1662 in England. Uh, King Charles II had just married a young Portuguese princess, Catarina, and to make her happy, he began tapping into the Chinese tea import trade um, to supply this new beverage called tea to his new bride. And she told her friends about it, and pretty soon tea becomes the new hot thing among arist aristocrats in England. And then a company called the East Indian Company uh, starts making bank with this new craze, just making a ton of money. Uh, the only problem is that these Asian teas were also very rich in tannins, which produces a bitter aftertaste, especially if you oversteep them. Uh, and tannins can cause nausea if taken on an empty stomach. So the solution to this was to add sugar to the tea to both improve the bitterness and to help settle the upset stomach. So now tea is, is exploding. This is great for aristocracy, but terrible for the world as the new demand for sugar led to essentially the worst humanitarian practices in history, first with slavery in the Caribbean, and then the slave trading triangular route involving tea, sugar, and slaves, and other, and, and you know, uh, goods between the American, African, and European continents. And uh, this just led to astronomical riches for the later King George, which he used to build up the Royal Navy and expand the empire leading to further domination and further human, humanitarian devastation uh, of which we are, are living with considerably, have lived with, um, and has shook in the world uh, for pretty much for uh, perpetuity since then. So what does this have to do with Yapan Holly? Uh, well, around the year 1789, Europeans were beginning to learn about this new medicinal tea from America that had caffeine, but didn't have the bitterness of the tannins. So no tannins means Yapan tea didn't need as much sugar, uh, which drove the trade. And it's beginning to look like uh, Yapan tea could threaten this global tea trade that's making England so rich. Uh, and to make matters worse, England lost Florida to Spain in 1783. and 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 Florida is at the heart of Yapan Holly's range. So then when England started to see Yapan as a threat to their tea, they started a marketing campaign saying it was the patriotic duty of all English people 
to drink tea from England. And uh, then enters Carl Linnaeus, the father of what we consider modern taxonomy and someone that had no interest in the British tea campaign, but likely had a big influence on the outcome because Linnaeus mistakenly thought that the Yaupon holly was the same species as this, as a, a newly discovered Dahoon holly. And so he gave them both the same name. And eventually this mis mis mistake was discovered. And so the two species needed to be separated. And now enter William Aiton, who's the Royal Gardener at Kew Gardens, a loyal friend of King George, who's just making a ton of money uh, on the tea trade. And Aiton was likely also on the payroll for the East India Company. All of those uh, entities had much to lose if this new Yapan Holly threatens the domination of East India tea. Um, and he just, you know, looks like he's up to no good. Uh, so Aiton de devises a very simple plan to help eliminate Yapan from the marketplace. Yapan Holly and Dahoon Holly needed to be separated anyway um, from a taxonomic perspective. So to correct Linnaeus's mistake, he leaves Dahoon Holly with the original name of Ilex Cassin, and then he rebrands the Yapan Holly with a wonderful new Latin name, uh, Ilex Vomitoria, or the holly that makes you vomit. And that was likely the stake in the heart for this upstart Yapan tea that was threatening the East India Company. And to this day, Yapan tea remains in obscurity. There have been several attempts to market Yapan tea over the years, um, but they all eventually failed, and many consider it's because of this Latin name. Uh, and it didn't help that the Brits could also point back to that black drink uh, that I mentioned earlier, which did cause vomiting, even though numerous studies confirms that it wasn't the Yapan Holly that, that gave it the emetic properties. It wasn't that that was inducing the vomities, but vomiting. But, you know, you're trying to explain to someone that, you know, as, as you're offering them this Ilex of Vomitoria, it just probably makes them not want to drink it. So the plan worked out brilliantly for King George, for William Aiton, and for the East India Tea Company. Yet companies keep pushing, and it's possible that someday Yapan Holly will finally come on the scene just as it did for its South American counterpart, Yerba Mate, which is a caffeinated holly from South America, uh, Ilex Paraguariensis. In fact, the actress Alicia Wainwright recently published a letter titled, A Misleading Name Reduces Marketability, Marketability of a Healthful and Stimulating Natural Product, a Comparative Taste Test of Infusions of a Native Florida Holiday, Holly and Yerba Mate. And they found out that people actually preferred the taste of Yapan Holly to Yerba Mate by quite a bit. Uh, but people were just completely put off by that name, Vomitoria. And so Yerba Mate has done well. And Yapan Holly kind of continues to remain in obscurity hundreds of years after William Aiton devised that plan. Um, but Yapan Holly continues to be a favorite, continues to be favored as a native shrub in landscaping. Uh, so maybe it's only a matter of time before uh, it, it catches on. But we here in the North where Yapan Holly doesn't grow we can also plant a beautiful holly species we know of as winterberry or Ilex verticillata, which is an, also a, a very important native species for wildlife. Um, so we, we, can, we can get into the native landscaping uh, with holly as well. So that wraps up our brief look at the holly. Uh, I'd encourage you to consider planting a native holly as part of your landscaping and Whatever your traditions are as we enter the new year, I hope 2022 brings you peace, healing, and further enjoyment of our backyard wildlife. So thank you for joining. I will turn off my screen. So.